The Hoops and Hockey Podcast. Balls into Taylor. Eight seconds. What's he going to do? Oh, a little fake there. Gets past Watson. Into the lanes. Jumper goes! And he's fouled! One to come! And the scorcher has taken the lead! We're down to 15. Murray inside to Fraser. Ten seconds. What's Fraser going to do? Battles his way to the basket. Goes baseline. Scores! Beautiful! The scores have come away with the noise there's amazing! Outside, Kaylin will take the roof off. He does! Kaylin for three! Scorchers up by four! Wow! Hello everyone, my name's Niall Gray. Welcome to a special edition of the Hoops and Hockey Podcast. The Hoops and Hockey Podcast. It's the news that a lot of British basketball fans have been waiting for. A British Basketball League team will be entering pan-European competition next season. That team, the London Lions. The competition, the Basketball Champions League. Our guest is the man who will be leading them on that European adventure, Vince McCauley. We caught up with Vince just a few hours after the announcement was made on Friday morning to see how he felt now that it is all official. Well, now it's a little surreal at the moment. Um, You know, you have these things that you plan and you dream of and you try and make happen. uh, And that's how I have always been in what I've always done in basketball. And that's how the Lions are. You know, we wanted to be a top team in the country. We wanted to be competitive in European games. And they are all great wishes and wants, but you have to take the steps to actually do that. Um, and we're so happy that those steps we've taken have, have brought us to the point where we, you know, we can actually take the court against some of the best teams in Europe, representing, you know, not just the London Lions, but the BBL and British basketball as a whole. How does it feel to be representing the BBL next season in European competition? It's huge. It's huge for us as a group. It's huge for me personally. You know, I've said a lot lately, I think, where I've been fed up about the negativity around British basketball. A lot of people, even within basketball, running the game down. You know what? You get what you deserve. At the end of the day, we have to go out there as basketball people and show that this game deserves whatever we believe it deserves. You know, whether that be funding, whether that be facilities, whether that be respect, you know, and that's certainly the way I've worn it on my sleeve. And, um, you know, I know that this is important for us to show that we can compete at that level. Uh, the BBL is a very, very underrated league. Um, and, and when people say it enough that it's not good, it tends to permeate other people. But actually, it's very, very underrated. And I think we have an opportunity to surprise a few people. We've got to kind of work on what our brand of British basketball is and how we can take that against some of the behemoths that lay out there. One of the things when teams go into Europe is they obviously adjust their roster. What are you going to do differently about recruitment this year? Are you going to have like a lot more British players or are you going to try and get players who've played in Europe? What's your philosophy? You don't have to give any names away, obviously. They'll come <laughs> a, but what, what's your philosophy when you're going to recruit that squad? Well, you know, it's, I'm not sure you can get any more British players. I think we already have 10 British players. So you, you've already, you know, we've already flown that flag. Um, we certainly have the best British player in Justin Robinson, I hope. You know, hopefully we'll be able to announce shortly, you know, that we can get him over the line. That's a, you know, this, this announcement was a big decision in his decision-making process. Um, but yes, in terms of the recruitment, I think um, we're going to obviously need a very, very deep team. Um, we're in conversation with the BBL. We, we, you know, we talk regularly about what that might look like. Um, we have some hurdles to overcome vis-a-vis salary caps and things like that and how we can maneuver around that rotation of players um, I spent a lot of time talking to the guys at Leicester about how that was for them in the difficulties that they faced, you know, travel on a Tuesday, sorry, travel on a, on a, on a Monday to get somewhere on a Tuesday to practice that night, play on the Wednesday, fly back on a Thursday, and then you're in Manchester on the Friday. So there are challenges. So the depth of the squad, the quality of the squad uh, is going to be important. And I think more so the quality. Um, we've got to get guys who've played in this competition, maybe even higher, you know, if we can get some I don't know where else they play Euro League players, maybe or NBA players. I don't know if we can do some of that stuff. That puts us in a better position. Right, as you said, you obviously spoke to the riders. What what did you learn from their experience? Well, I think first of all, it was credit to them that they took that leap uh, that no one had done in a long while. You know, to coach Paternostro, Kevin Routledge at the club, and obviously Russell Levinston, who makes things happen down there. I, I went down to Leicester every time to watch every game and help them commentate on the TV and see the teams, learn from them, and I think. The travel was the biggest thing that they talked about. The travel, the, the, just the hours on the road, the, you know, 
coming back, not being able to prepare properly for your weekend BBL games, um, the injuries and the stress and strain on the on the players' joints and muscles. You know, 22 of you, you know how it's like when you're going on holiday with a family, you're going, going through the airport security, you can't take any water. Well, you've got 22 blokes with you who drink <laughs> gallons of water, you know, 700 pounds buying water the other side of security. I mean, these are all things that no one ever thinks about. We think about the bright lights and the winning basket. But if you don't get those things right, you're never going to get the opportunity to take the last shot. Why is it you feel that so few teams, I mean, you mentioned the riders there. I think the previous team before that was the Guildford Heat, about yes. what, 10, 11 years before that. Why is it so few BBL teams do try the European route? It's very difficult now. It's very, very difficult. I think logistically it's a massive challenge, as we've just talked about. So that, in, it, in fact, mm. has an impact on the kind of team that you, you must have on and off the floor. And then it's very expensive because how do you blend those player requirements within what we do in the BBL? And even if we didn't have issues of salary cap, you know, it's still a lot of money. Um, and, and we're talking about a COVID recovery, recovery COVID situation, so like, shall I say, and, and what that's going to look like. So it's a challenge on everyone. But I've come at it from a slightly different angle on the, on the basis that COVID isn't just affecting us. Uh, it's also affecting some of those big teams out in Europe. Um, mm. I do believe that whether, we, whether there was COVID or no COVID, and we were going into this competition, um, we were going to be starting from zero now. We, you look at the teams now, on, on, I mean, we haven't had the draw yet, but you can see the teams who are in the qualifiers, and you've got you know, teams from Serbia, teams from Lisbon in Portugal, and places like this. They would have been 10 out of 10 had we been facing them in a non-COVID situation. We're facing them in a post-COVID situation. They're going to be less than 10. They might be seven, six, five. Mm. Who knows? So this is a great opportunity for us to make that first challenge for the London Lions. And if we can get in there and lay a solid foundation, maybe we can build on that and maybe other BBL clubs can build on that. Do you have an opt-out in, pla opt in place if you drop out of the BCL or will you go into the FIBA Europe Cup? No, no. We're, we're in here for the long haul. We're, you know, we're in here with our new partners. They want to see a successful British team in Europe, whatever that means. So yeah. we don't have an opt-out. We are opting in. We are opting in fully into playing in Europe. Um, should we not get to the group stages, and by the way, the group stages is our goal, then of yeah. course we will play in the, in the FIBA Europe Cup. And, and why not? Why shouldn't we? We should do. We should, we've got lots to learn. And, and every game we play out there is going to be another brick in the wall. Yeah, I'd say the incentive to get to the group stages, I mean, FIBA touting this as their strongest BCL lineup ever. And you look at the teams that are in the group stages, and I'm sure there's lots of teams in there you would just love to go up against. <laughs> well, we don't want to go up against that poor Jerusalem right away, if that's okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I mean, when you look at it from a holistic London point of view, you know, Greek teams, of course we want them. Lithuanian teams, of course we do. Israeli teams, of course we do. We get any of those teams at the copper box, I can see a full house. Because you look at the, the people who live in London, who, who come from there, who recognize the game, you know, who respect the game in their countries like we don't respect it in ours. And maybe we can force the media to pay some attention. Um, everything isn't about football. There are other people, superb elite athletes, male and female, competing at a very, very high level in this country, and they, they deserve that equal respect. I noticed when the um, Guildford Heat were in Europe many years ago, and I also noticed a similar stance with the riders, that when it comes to a, Euro a team, uh, sorry, BBL team playing in Europe, fans tend to forget their tribal loyalties they have at the weekend and support the team that's playing in Europe. Will you be able to attract fans to Copper Box from other clubs next season? Well, well I hope so. I mean, we've had some very kind messages uh, already online, on social media, everywhere, personal messages and so on. Uh, you know, you know I, I think we're all basketball fans, like you said. And, mm -hmm. and, and like I mentioned about Leicester, I enjoyed watching, you know, homegrown British players playing against some of those European teams, you know, with ex-NBA players on the rosters. Um, I, I'd love to see that. And if Newcastle were in Europe, I would make a trip up there and have a, have a look at the game. So, so I think as basketball fans, we would like to see that. Obviously, we're aware that it's going to be a Tuesday night or a Wednesday night in London and so on and so forth. And there are some challenges. But at the end of the day, this is what we're gunning for, right? This is, we'd like to see a world in which there are three or four BBL teams holding their own in Europe and, and bringing some of the super powerhouses into London and, and, and Leicester and Newcastle and Plymouth and anywhere else for that matter. Um, so I hope we can galvanize them by, by capturing their attention for those games. I think, like you said, having, having some of the better British players with us will be a big help. Bringing some exciting stars in from Europe and abroad would also help. And, and turning that into victories. I can't, you know, I look at some of those 
uh, GB games where, where GB is winning and the atmosphere is electric and the fans are totally engaged. And if we can get some of that at the couple of bucks, that'd be terrific. So just going back to one of your earlier questions about, you know, if a Greek team came to London or some, obviously, as we've seen over the years, I can go right back to Kingston because there's so many different communities in London. When a big team comes over, they, they bring fans with them. Yep. You, I mean, we saw it with Greece when Greece came to the Copper Box. We, <laughs> we saw it when um, there was uh, Zhao Giris Counters played at the Copper Box against a Polish team. Fans yep. came out for that. It's, it's one of those things. Um, is that what you'd like to see at the Copper Box? Not only a full house, but see a balance of fans. You know what I mean? A lot of nice away, just for the atmosphere. Well, yeah. I mean, we need the away fans. We need them to bring that noise and that uh, that that uh, general enthusiasm. I mean, we're going to have a job on our hands to 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 educate our fans, to to encourage our fans. I mean, uh, you know, one of the reasons you know we've often talked in the past about are we the London Lions or should we change our name to the East London Lions or South London Lions? You know, this is about London, and I think that when we look at what the fans that some of our Premier League teams are doing, you know, the West Ham fans, Chelsea fans, Tottenham fans. Can we engage some of that raucous people and, and, and get that vibe going at the Copper Box? Because in as much as we have to develop our BBL playing style into Europe, we need to develop our fans so we can also get out on that stage and make some noise for us. That's it. I mean, I've, I've worked in European basketball for a few years now, and I can remember going back to the days when the Heat were in Europe. Just, just the atmosphere when you played a big foreign yep. team, the atmosphere yep. those fans would bring. And for me, I would just love to see some of that atmosphere replicated, even in a normal domestic BBL game. Well, just, I, I, yeah, I think it's going to be tough to replicate that in a normal BBL game unless we start practicing it. You know, I think mm, you know, I'm, mm. I'm with you. I was there at, at Guildford when you had Brian Dukes and, and Mike Martin going up against some of them top European teams. And the atmosphere was just you know, to die for. But I think we need some of that contact, that European contact to engage so our fans can see that it's okay to yell at the top of your voice and scream and shout and support and bang some drums. Um, hopefully this is the first step in that direction and we can let that, some of that rub off onto us. Right, you've got just over a couple of weeks until the draw. What's, what's going to be happening in this, this next fortnight or so? <laughs> well, I mean, obviously, we've been working towards this a, a while, so we have been busy in lockdown. Uh, lockdown has really helped us to prepare. Um, I think, you know, logistically and all those things that we're going to have to face, we won't specifically know those details till, I think, the 15th of July when that draw is made. But, you know, the team is well taking shape right now. We, we know where we're going with that. We're in contact with our guys. We're, we're talking about what kind of fitness they're, they're at at the moment and what they're doing. We're trying to coordinate that. Um, and, and, you know, we're just developing with the coaching staff. We have our weekly coaching Zoom calls and, and we're preparing for how we're going to play. So all of those things are happening. But really, the nitty gritty will be when players start arriving and we get on the floor and we set our goals and our targets. Um, that's when stuff becomes real. Now, Vince, you've coached, obviously, against BBL teams many times. But you get a chance now to go up against European teams. And as you well know, the European game can be slightly different. What are you most looking forward to? Well, I mean, the, um, the main thing that I'm looking at from a coaching perspective, we have a huge respect for what the guys do in Europe. Um, we know all the fantastic, great players that there are. I think, I believe that we have great British players. I believe we can blend a different kind of style. I don't think we'll be going out and signing, you know, two or three, six foot, 11 guys who can shoot the three ball and all this kind of stuff. We, we don't have that. We can't do that. We have to find a different way to play against the European teams. I, I think I know the way. I, I think I have a plan. Um, I think there's a team that we can put on the floor that represents the style that we have. So I'm looking to pit that against some of the more orchestrated, patient European type teams. But, you know, that's only a thought process. We, we don't know. You know. We had a crazy game against uh, the team from Lithuania with the Ball Brothers on it, which was 100 miles an hour. I don't yeah. think that's how they normally play. But... But yes, you know, we have to come up with our own style. And I'm really, really excited to, to, to come up against a different style of play. Um, we, we're not mistaken in terms of it being a challenge. We know it's going to be a challenge. Um, but it's a challenge that we want. Uh, I think uh, that's, that's the message that I would give to my players. You know, they all know it's a challenge we want. And the group of guys that we bring together, not so much necessarily from a talent perspective, but from a desire and want to be here perspective, if we get that right, I think it's going to be interesting. When did this dream first materialize for you? When did you first say, you know what, I really want to take a BBL team into Europe? 
Well, yeah, that's a good question to think about when that first materialized. You know, I, I've always believed in what I thought a BBL team looked like and how, what it represented within its community and what it stood for within its community, the work that all the BBL clubs do in the community, uh, in schools, out of hours, basketball, uh, trying, trying to create positives in, in their own communities. That's what a BBL team is all about. And then, obviously, like some of our fans out there, you come through with the older generation of players, your Larry Dassies and, and Daryl Thomases, and you move to your John Whites, Robert Youngloves and Tony Windlesses, uh, all these kind of guys. And you start thinking to yourself, actually, we are all solid BBL clubs. We are doing all of this stuff. We've got top international players coming here. We've got really good British players, more so recently when you've seen the likes of Justin Robinson here and some of our British players coming home. It's... It's as we moved into the copper box and you looked at that venue, a superb venue, international venue, and you're thinking, actually, with our community clubs in the BBL and the style we play and the right players, why can't we take our rightful place alongside some of those European teams? I, I know the funding structures are different and they get the facilities for free and the councils give them money and all this kind of stuff. But put all that to one side, if we could get to a position where we could actually give ourselves a good shot. So I've been thinking about it seriously, I would say, for the last seven or eight years. Uh, but slowly coming to fruition as we move towards winning the championship here and having more and more British players actually wanting to be part of it. Looking forward to next season, um, do we even know roughly when we might be able to get fans back in the building? Because obviously you want that copper box rocking, don't you? Yeah, that, this is a big one. And obviously we, you know, we are in the middle of a pandemic, albeit with slight easing of lockdown. I mean, I think now that we're moving to the one metre separation, that's good. But obviously, indoor facilities are not open. Theatres are being decimated. Um, I'm hopeful that the next two weeks could see venues open, uh, whether it's with or without social distancing. I don't know. But if we have to, if we have to be meter distanced watching games, then that's not so bad in a six and a half thousand seater facility. I think that means we can get a third, a third or so to two and a half thousand people in there. Um, that would be a start. But it would be great to to, to get to what, mid-September, moving towards October, and actually also all of us, everyone really, come out of this lockdown situation in a positive way and do the things that we love to do. I was actually just thinking the other day, if there's one venue where you could have a slight bit of social distancing, it would be the copper box because you've got upstairs and downstairs. And like, Absolutely. Those, and it, Absolutely. And it, but ideally, you want that game that first game you want that to be rocking so what are you even what's the plan now obviously once you get the go-ahead once i mean we obviously we don't know when it's going to happen but once you get the go-ahead to say yep you fans can come, start coming back to arenas again what's what happens then are you just going to go full full throttle well, the you, market yeah. Or? <laughs> yeah we have to i mean you know as you know as you know we have our giant screens across london uh, yeah. which promote the game. So we, we need to be back on there. You, you know, we, we have a marketing company coming on board now to engage us with radios, with, with, with TV stations. Um, and, and obviously, uh, hopefully our acquisition of players and we can get our players out there to spread the word so people know that it's happening. I think that's the biggest thing, especially coming out of lockdown, that people know it's happening and, and wanting to represent. I think we'll be all out there telling everyone what that day, game is, who it's against and what it is and, and asking them to please come and show support for British basketball. Uh, what's the interest been like since it's been announced the Lions are entering the European competition? Well, it's it's only been six and a half hours and it's been phenomenal. The, the, we've, we've got three people answering media inquiries. We, we've got people doing all sorts. I've been nonstop on the phone. Uh, the assistant coaches have been handling stuff. It, it's, <laughs> the interest has been through the roof. And uh, if we can maintain this at this rate, we'll be doing well. Now, I'll finish off on this. Since you've been around the, I know you long, many, many years. You've been, a, you've been around the game a long, long time. Do you feel like a little kid at the moment, like at Christmas? <laughs> I certainly do. I, I certainly do. I sat down having my cup of tea this morning, and my wife said, why are you staring into space? And I said, well, not quite sure how we got here, but my goodness, it's a great place to be at. Well, I wish you the best of luck, Vince. I shall be down definitely to some games next season. Uh, Thank you. No, no, we'd love to have you guys down there. Obviously, you know, you do a terrific job promoting the sport and we need more and more of that. For more information about the draw, which takes place on Wednesday, July the 15th, and how you can watch that draw live, visit the official Basketball Champions League website, which is championsleague.basketball. That's all for this special edition of the Hoops and Hockey podcast. If you like what we're doing, please hit that subscribe button or give us a like. 
Bye for now.